to go ahead and record this video or record this lecture in your notes as Cabeza de Vaca and the wanderings uh, through Texas. So Cabeza de Vaca, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, is one of those uh, indispensable characters to the history of Texas and, for that matter, the southwestern United States and Mexico as well. Uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca is born to elite stock in Spain. However, he is not uh, the high elite of Spain. Alvar Nunez is highly educated. Uh, he had been in combat. Uh, his family had a long history in combat. And his full uh, title, his full name and title as we know him, and I will sometimes describe him as Cabeza de Vaca, is Head of the Cow. Head of the Cow. Cabeza de Vaca. Alvar Nunez's family takes its heritage or its, uh, its uh, knightly title, as it were, from the fact that, uh, according to legend, Alvar Nunez is like great, great, great grandfather helped defeat the Moors in a box-in canyon outside of Sevilla uh, during the Reconquista. And how he did it, the way the legend goes, is, is that Alvar Nunez's father basically laid out cow's heads, bleached bone cow heads sort of thing, so the Spaniards could find their way out of this uh, canyon and then uh, turn and conquer or turn and attack the Moors. Uh, whether that actually happened, as you can say, when I start using the word legend, I don't necessarily believe it, but at the same time, that's the family legend. It may be partially true, probably not completely true. But anyways, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca, we find him here in about 1527. We find him being attached to a expedition into the New World. In fact, actually, he had been here before, uh, but when we find him, we pick him up with the uh, work of a one-eyed individual, a one-eyed conquistador you met in the lectures on Hernando Cortez. And I think when I talked about him, uh, Panfilio Narvaez, N-A-R-V-A-E-Z, N-A-R-V-A-E-Z, Panfilio Narvaez. We talk about him, or I talk about him generally as a third-rate individual, a third-string quarterback. Uh, just say, uh, he's not horrible, but he's not great. Um, describing him physically, Narvaez is about my age, about 40. He's a big man for the time period. He's about 6'1", strapping and strong, kind of uh, broad at the shoulders and hairy as a goat sort of thing, you know, built like a brick house. Anyways, Narvaez, to look at him and Narvaez to hear him, you would think he would have been a great soldier, uh, but he was a a fierce soldier, but not a great general. And I think that's the first thing you need to say about Narvaez. Uh, he is a, a bad officer as far as I'm concerned. Uh, at best, he's mediocre. He's, uh, he's not a great leader of man, men, and more particularly, he's not a good general. And one of the things I think you need to make note of here specifically, and it bears repeating if I've said it before, uh, but comparing him to Hernando Cortez, so the, uh, he of the sacking of the Aztec Empire, you find with Nervais is, is that uh, Nervais is far less politically adept than Cortez is. Write that down, please. Cortez, was, he was a good general, but in some respects, depends on who you read, but in some respects, Cortez may have been a better uh, politician. Cortez knew how to talk, and he knew how to communicate, and he knew how to, uh, to use an expression out of Louisiana from an old governor over there. He knew where people itched, and he knew how to scratch that itch. Uh, the itch can be money, the itch can be w uh, wine, it can be women, it can be song, it something. Maybe it's uh, altruism. But whatever it is, Cortez had the ability to, uh, uh, to figure out who his allies were and to know the weak spots of his enemies and exploit both as best possible. You, you see that in the sacking of the Aztec Empire by Cortez. Narvaez was more of the bull in the china closet. Uh, in fact, actually, he's maybe not even a bull in a china closet. Uh, one of his contemporaries uh, compared Captain Narvaez to a donkey, to an ass. And I mean that like in the old uh, King James Version, uh, the ass sort of thing, the braying of the asses. He said he was like an ass you had to hit in the head three times to get him to understand something because he forgot the first two lessons and the first two times you hit him. So uh, that was a contemporary speaking about Narvaez. So to kind of give you an idea of the man we're dealing with. But in 1527, Narvaez had been, uh, he'd been under house arrest. He'd lost his eye to Cortez. Uh, and eventually he, by 1527, Cort uh, Narvaez had wormed his way and worked his way back to Spain. And there, 
because of his connections, because of his wealth, because of his uh, uh, all the above, he is going to receive a vice royalty. Uh, I guess, again, that word viceroy pops back up again. He becomes viceroy of Florida. Let's use that in your notes. Viceroy of Florida. Florida. Now, you're thinking that's not so bad. Some of you have been to Florida, and uh, you're thinking that would be great. The problem is, is that uh, there's nothing in Florida back then. It's a flat peninsula. It's going to be a, a horrible experience. Uh, and in fact, the, I think this is really worth remembering now, is the Spanish, they know about Florida, but they don't know much if at all about Florida. They just call it La Florida, La Florida. And it's, it's just kind of like saying, you're, go, you're the, you're the uh, viceroy, you're the governor of Florida. And if you were to look at a map, Florida in the Spanish mindset was really North America, north of uh, Mexico. I say it like that for your notes. Florida could be north of Mexico, for all they knew. It was, they're working in a large degree of ignorance. Please write that word, ignorance. The Sp- and I don't mean that as a slur, at least in this context I don't. But the Spanish don't know the geography. They don't know the geography of Florida. They do not know what they're jumping off into. All the Spanish know is is that they hope they can find new territories to conquer and more especially new uh, natives to conquer and to establish themselves as as top dogs over of. So anyways, um, Panfilio Narvaez, we find him in 1527 giving the governorship of Florida from Spain. So... Narvaez starts out with about 500 men, maybe 600 men, in fact. They start out from uh, out of uh, Castilla, uh, out of Spain, and they work their way toward, well, eventually Florida. And so they start out, please put this in your notes, kind of a motley crew, kind of an adventurer's crew. You've got some elites and high aristocrats. You've got lower aristocrats like Alvar Nunez is. Uh, Old Cabeza de Vaca, and then you're going to have your soldados, uh, just regular foot soldiers from Spain. Also, you're going to have Portuguese, you'll have Greeks, you'll have some uh, Moors, there's a few Moorish slaves, and uh, by the time they get to Florida, they will have picked up, take that back, by the time they get, uh, they leave Spain, they pick up a handful of uh, Indians who had migrated from the New World to the Old World and were wanting to migrate back again as explorers, all with the hopes of establishing themselves as uh, uh, basically uh, haciendas uh, and uh, establishing themselves as lords over a new territory that would make them fabulously wealthy. All of which is to say is that this is a, a, a expedition with grand dreams and hopes. And so, if we turn the page now to the year 1528, we're going to find uh, Alvar Nunez as the number two, or at least he claimed to be number two, and you've got to be a little careful with him at times. But we find Panfilio Narvaez and his 500-plus men sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, stopping first at the Canary Islands, then to Hispaniola. Hispaniola today is Haiti or the Dominican Republic. That's where uh, Columbus had his first uh, uh, beachhead, in a sense. But also, please put this in your notes, too. At each of those stops, Panfilo Narvaez is going to lose a few men. In fact, actually, by the time he leaves uh, Hispaniola, Narvaez loses about 100 men. And um, Narvaez is uh, the reason people were leaving his command and running away from, as it were. A lot of it has to do with the fact that Narvaez uh, didn't pay as well. There was a lot of uncertainty. He was, uh, he was not particularly well-loved. Uh, and frankly, uh, there was great opportunity on Hispaniola. Then they sail to, uh, now we're in the, uh, coming into the spring of 1528, say about March, they're in Cuba. They're try- and they're trying, they, Narvaez and his expedition, but Narvaez especially, is trying to hire himself a shipboat captain who will, a shipboat captain, uh, who will basically help them navigate the Gulf of Mexico. Well, it's a problem. It's a major problem, in fact. They can't find one. And, um, but what happens here is uh, while Narvaez, Alvar Nunez, and uh, the now starting to dwindle, I think you probably ought to write that in your notes, this Narvaez expedition, you're going to start at the top here at about 500, but as this story goes, like, a, uh, like a, the letter V, the, the numbers just dwindle down and down and down. Well, while the Spaniards are trying to fi- find themselves a captain to take them into and uh, navigate the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, somebody who knows the territory, 
these Spaniards are going, some of them are going to die at the hands of an early season hurricane. I, I think one of the things you probably ought to write in your notes, and this is kind of dovetails what I lectured on with Hernando Cortez, <coughs> in the fact that for the uh, natives in Mexico, the Aztecs and those other tribes, many of them thought, my God, these uh, Spaniards, this is a, a strange territory. This is, these are aliens. These are from out of this world sorts of people. By the 1520s, especially here we are, 1528, I think you may be, uh, may be well worth noting that uh, for Spaniards, they start to wonder what type of world did we wander into. Are, are we in some sort of foreign t land? Yes. Are we in a foreign world, i.e. an alien world? Because th this is something Alvar Nunez points out while he was in Cuba. He got caught up in a hurricane. Please mark that down. Alvar Nunez got caught up in a hurricane. They lost a couple of ships in the process. And when Alvar Nunez talked about this, he said, me and these men had to walk, this is in Cuba, in the springtime, he said, we had to walk arm in arm in order to get from one point to the next. Uh, he said that they had seen trees stripped. If you're from South Texas or got land down around uh, Corpus Christi and Rockport, uh, you've been down there for on vacation with your family. The thing is, is that uh, if you remember in the last few years after Harvey, where you've seen hurricanes like Harvey, that hurricane will just start to strip off the, the leaves, and it leaves a barren tree. They, he recorded all that. He recorded the, the eye of a hurricane going by, the winds going one way and the winds coming the other, all of which is to say they, were, they had no, never seen that before. They'd never seen a hurricane in uh, Spain before. So Alvar Nunez... Uh, and these Spaniards uh, are getting beset already, and they can't, they're having trouble finding a captain who knows his, th his business. Please make note of this, because this is getting, getting ready to get worse. And, oh, by the way, some of the men just say, you know what, I'm staying in Cuba. So uh, by the time we uh, are really ready to put them into the Gulf of Mexico, Alvar Nunez, Panfilo Nervais, and all these other Spaniards, they leave out of Havana in uh, March of 1528, and... Mark this down. They are going to uh, land along the coast of Florida, probably Tampa, Florida, probably Tampa, Florida, Tampa Bay, in April of 1528. Now, for those of you who know your geography, Florida is not that far from Cuba. It's, what, 90 miles from Key West? And some of you have seen the markers there at Key West. The journal kept by Alvar Nunez goes like this. He basically says... We were on the high seas. They got caught up in the Gulf Stream, and they're trying to get to Mexico, or what they think is northern, northern Mexico. And that what also happens to be, in their mind, conflated, Florida. They think they're going that direction. It takes them 50 days to get to Tampa. They're, they're hopelessly lost. They're hopelessly lost. They are navigating by dead reckoning, which is not easy in, uh, in the hands of a good mariner, and the captain they pick up is not good at all, and the conquistadors themselves don't know what they're doing. So they land along the coast of Florida at Tampa, Florida in April of 1528, completely deserted, uh, and they are in bad shape. Go ahead and write that down. They're already starting to see the effects. In fact, actually, they started out when they left Cuba in March of 28, and when they landed in late April of 28, then they landed after those 50 days, they lost, according to Cabeza de Vaca, they lost 38 horses, 38 horses. And the reason I bring this up, they started out with 80 horses, and they get down to 42 horses. Put that number in your notes, 42 horses. What's interesting is, is that if you read old uh, manuscripts, and some people get awfully frustrated with them and say you can't rely upon them, I, I don't believe that. Uh, but what you notice with uh, Cabeza de Vaca when he writes his account years after the fact, he says that, that we had 42 horses, 42 horses. He kept saying, he kept reemphasizing those 42 horses. Um, it's fair to remember that Cabe Alvar Nunez, like most and frankly all to some degree or another, all of those conquistadors are not just greedy, they're not just looking for glory, they're also God-fearing in their own way. Alvar Nunez seemingly more than most. 
if you look into the Bible, the number 42 isn't particularly prominent. If you get to look in, some people get carried away with numerology in the Bible, uh, at least they did in years gone by, you know, get seven and six and this and that. But when you talk about Alvar Nunez, the number 42 is, well, it, it alludes to, I think, it alludes to the 42 wanderings of the children of Israel. So if you know your Bible, you remember from Old Testament, maybe from high school, excuse me, from uh, catechism or Sunday school or whatever, you should remember that Moses led the children of Israel out into the wilderness and there they wandered for 40 years. But there were actually 42 separate wanderings as they went. And so what Alvar Nunez is saying by those 42 horses being lost and reemphasizing it again and again is probably, I think, he's saying, I am going to be, we were like the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness and they are going to wander. Well, when they get to Tampa, Florida, Narvaez basically says to his men, would you like to get off the boat? And they said, yes, yes, yes. They go inland, and every time they uh, come inland, they come across uh, occasionally uh, mostly little villages and, and little uh, hamlets that have been abandoned by local uh, Florida uh, na Native Americans. But occasionally they come across them, and then write this down. Here we are now looking now in May and June of 1528. And every time the Spanish, especially here at Narvaez, says to these uh, Fl Florida Indians, he they say to them, where's the gold? And put this in your notes too, where's the corn? Where's the gold? And now I'm adding something new to your notes from, say, from uh, the second of the Aztec Empire. Where's the corn? Where's the corn? This, the natives figured out rather quickly, uh, it didn't take long, you see this in Texas and in Mexico as well, they start saying to, this, the, uh, to the Spaniards, there, 100 miles away from here, 75 miles away from here, there's a big city, You're, you'll find all the gold you want, go that direction. Basically, the natives figured out rather quickly if you spun a good yarn and you pointed that direction a long way away, the Spanish would oftentimes leave you alone and leave. That is a common practice uh, used by lots and lots of natives when they come into the Spanish, come into contact with the Spanish during this exploration period. Before <clears throat> Narvaez and his men leave and go into the interior of Florida, they sit down and have a discussion about what should we do. And Narvaez and his men make the decision. Narvaez is the captain, so he ultimately does it. But he says, we need to go with the interior. So if you would, write this in your notes now. Write this town or write this river into your notes. Rio Panuco, P-A-N-U-C-O, Rio Panuco. Rio Panuco, or Rio de los Palmas. You'll find uh, it on the northern coast of, excuse me, the northern Gulf Coast of Mexico today. When the Spaniards in June of 1528 jump off and decide to leave the Tampa, Florida area and, and they go into the interior of Florida, they think, mark this down, and this is uh, how give you an idea of how far off they are, how far the Spanish are f off from where they think they are. The Spanish tell, uh, the, excuse me, Narvaez tells his shipboat captains, he says, we'll see you in a few days. There's only 35 miles there's only 35 miles between us and Rio Panuco, Rio de las Palmas. And in fact, it's about 1,500 miles along the coast. And a few minutes ago, I mentioned to you the fact that many Spaniards thought that they may be dealing with an out-of-the-world experience. For them, they thought that the sun, because this, they thought they were on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, not the Gulf Coast of Florida, though they'll call it Florida. They thought that the sun should be rising in the east over the water, not setting in the west over the water, like it does in Florida. So everything is backwards. It's backwards. Hurricanes, the sun setting backwards. And as they travel, they, the Spaniards, travel into the interior, they're going to come into contact with alligators, whom they've never seen before. What happens to them when they come into contact with alligators? It kills some of them. Then they also come into contact with malaria, come into contact with fevers and dysentery. Some of the men die from things they never thought they could die from before. Please put that in your notes. And last but not least, whereas most of the Native Americans come to hear of or get a glimpse of the Spanish and they flee for the hills, they run for the hills and get away. And eventually they change their tactics too. 
in July of 1528, this one native who was dressed like a, a peacock, dressed in a yellow blazer, not blazer, yellow outfit with feathers and furs and so forth. And he comes to uh, Narvaez and he says, do you want to find gold? And a Spanish who said, of course we do. And what the this, uh, perf- uh, this plumed and gaudy looking uh, native chieftain says, there is a great city called Appalachia. Appalachia. And for those of you who have been to northern Florida, you've heard of Appalachicola, Tallahassee. In that general part of the state, this man said, I will take you to Appalachia. There is a gigantic city, just like Tenochtitlan, with lots, and I'm adding that part in, but basically the Spanish said, oh my gosh, this is our Tenochtitlan. There were just enough hints of gold, and there were just enough promises of great wealth that the Spanish wanted to believe it. Yet as you go from June to July to now August of 1528, the Spanish are losing men, onesies and twosies here and there. They're being sniped at and attacked by natives in Appalachia, A-P-A-L-A-C-H-A, E, excuse me, Appalachia. Appalachia is the size of Snook in comparison to, say, Houston, comparison to, say, College Station. Snook's a tiny berg. The Spanish are desperate, by the way. And the reason they kept asking about corn, too, and every time they would come across these, these uh, natives, they'd ask for gold and they'd ask for corn. We, we figure the, corn, the gold part, we've d- covered that enough. But why the corn? Some of it has to do with the fact that these Spaniards were getting, well, the Spanish were getting very hungry for themselves and also for their horses. The horses needed fodder. But secondly, put this in your notes, and this is why on a more civilizational level, uh, you'll see me take this up in a few minutes, is is that you'll see Alvar Nunez and his men, Panfilio or Narvaez, they know that if there is corn stored and corn grown, for example, could be other foodstuffs, but corn particularly, if a tribe is growing corn, it is advancing or is civilized and advanced in a sense. And that is a type of uh, culture that you can replace the leadership of and set yourself atop. Uh, Cortez did the same thing in Mexico, actually, as well. But they're always asking for corn, and they're always asking for gold. Have you seen the gold? But by the time you bring this uh, now forward to late September 1528, the Spanish are in horrible condition. They have dwindled from, uh, when they landed at Tampa, Florida, they had 300 men. Now they're down to about 200 men. That's a heck of a lot of attrition. So they lost about a third of their men to various deaths. They come to the conclusion that they're never going to find their ships again. And so instead of hugging the coast, which was very difficult and hard to do and to travel, they decide they're going to travel westward and they're going to find, they're going to find Mexico and Rio de las Palmas, Rio Panuco. Well, the problem is for the Spanish, they don't, they don't have shipwrights. They don't have shipmakers on hand. They have no Martin Lopez. The thing is, is that when they talk about the Spanish here under Panfilo and Navais, most of them are soldiers of fortune of some stripe or another or some type or another with a handful of priests and a handful of other. But the thing is, is that by the time you get to late September 1528, they start cutting down trees. They, start, they use everything in sight. And they to to make this work, they I think for all that I will criticize Narvaez on, and I'm about to h- hammer him some more. But please put this in the no- your notes. The type of men you're dealing with here in Florida, they are the, not the sort to sit down in the mud and cry and then die. They're trying to survive and survive desperately, and uh, they they make a mighty effort to get to Mexico, and they're going to do it by getting on the Gulf, of, getting into the Gulf of Mexico. They lash barges, they make barges out of, well, hardwoods. They cut down trees. They kill all their horses. They jerk the, be- jerk the horse meat, meaning they basically dry it. Uh, they take the hide, and they tan it, and they uh, cure it so they can make uh, basically freshwater pouches or a canteen out of, and on and on I can go. They use everything in sight to make these ships or make these uh, floating barges. And when they load them up, 49 on one uh, bu- uh, vessel, 47 in another, 48 and 49, basically 200 when it's all said and done on these four vessels. Um, 
my daughter was sitting at my computer around me today. And so let's see if you can see this. Let me put this up to the you can see the six on the the tape measure. If you can see the six on the tape measure, the reason I'm putting this up in front of your ca the camera is so you'll get an idea is, is that all of six inches is how f high above the water those uh, little vessels rode. Now, some of you like to go fishing, and some of you like to go uh, back in the bay bayous and swamps of southeast Texas, or maybe Louisiana. But can you imagine being six inches above the water, and you're in the Gulf of Mexico. You're not in a little backwater bayou. You were on the, on the Gulf, and you're trying to hold on for dear life. Most of these men, by the way, are shirtless at this point in time. And slowly but surely, they're going to make their way westward and westward and westward. Uh, they pass the mouth of the Mississippi River. Uh, they pass the uh, marshes there around Lake Charles, Louisiana, southeast Texas. And by November, please put this in your notes, November of 1528, they find themselves probably, because we don't know for certain, but they find themselves prob probably at Galveston Island. Galveston Island. And they call it eventually Mahaldo. Mahaldo. The Isle of Bad Fortune. On, let me see if I got this written down here. November 6, 1528. On November 6, 1528, the Spanish land along Galveston Island. And there they come into contact with some of the first Texas Indians that we'll talk about in this course. They are given a few uh, trinkets and goodies by these Texas natives, and uh, they, the Spanish, try to launch their boats in high and heavy surf there in late, uh, excuse me, early November 1528. They launch on November 7th to get out of Texas and to keep heading westward, or actually it'll be going southward along the coastal bend. They don't get too far out into the water, and it all goes to pieces on them. Mark this down. November 7th, 1528 was about 35 degrees. November 7th, 1528 was a high wind like we had yesterday in the sense that the, the, it was, they had called it a gale warning on the coast. The surf was rough. And the men are as naked as jaybirds as they get on these boats and they shove off. Why on earth would you be naked in 35, 40 degree weather? The answer is, is you're trying to keep your clothes from getting wet. But unfortunately for many of these Spaniards, their ships, it was so rough that finally their, their little ships that, well, had treated them well for three months, basically, or excuse me, two months, this time finally gave up the ghost and sank in the rough surf there at Galveston. About 100 Spaniards are going to die in this uh, shipwreck. The, mo the rest of them, with maybe one or two exceptions, are so drained and so beat down that they are essentially worn out. They are essentially more dead than alive, and they are as naked as the day they were born. Now, that is not uh, good luck. Oh, by the way, one of the men who uh, drowns is Narvaez himself, an ill-fated man if there ever was one. So... Alvar Nunez, who we know all this about, uh, know all of this story from, Alvar Nunez is still alive, and along with about a hundred other Spaniards along the uh, coast of Texas in 1528, November 7th, and now going forward, November 8th. And if you would imagine with me for just a moment of your time, if you would imagine with me the type of Indians that Alvar Nunez came into contact with. I alluded to them a minute ago as some of the natives that are out there. Uh, these guys are the Karankawa Indians. I won't go in this course, I, I do not go through an exhaustive list of all the natives of Texas. I don't talk about every tribe in every part of the state of Texas. I never have, and I probably never will. But at the same time, this group here, this Karankawa, let me see if you got that in your list there, Karankawa, this Karankawa native tribe, uh, they cut quite the figure. When I say cut quite the figure, you wouldn't miss, you can't miss them. And in fact, actually, it was said about them that you even smelt them before you saw them. But when you talk about that, you know, if, if everybody stinks, nobody stinks. I don't know if that's completely true, but I think that is. Uh, I think one of the students here, you were in the Army. I think one of my students here was in the Army. And, uh, you know, taking a bath is, uh, is a privilege, uh, and uh, something good to have happen. I've also had people who were, who were rangers tell me, they said, and also infantrymen in the U.S. Army said, you know, when I got fresh and dry socks, that was a good day. So the thing is, is that when we talk about 
Alvar Nunez and his men laying along the coast of the, uh, Texas there at Galveston Island and coming into contact with these Karankawa Indians. Let me describe them to you physically. They were big. The average Karankawa male stood about six foot nine to six foot ten inches tall. These are gigantic men. And we're not talking about big, tall, and lanky, you know. You know, they're, basically they got arms that are more like pipe cleaners. I'm not talking like that. I'm talking about these guys. Some of y'all are big workout, you know, you like to, you know, pump iron and get strong and buff and all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's them. It seemed like they went down to Gold's Gym all the time. They had their bottle of water on the one hand and their whey protein in the other, you know, and they're pumping iron and so forth. Uh, it was also remarked by Alvar Nunez later on when he wrote his uh, definitive account of them, and it was seen by others later on who came into contact with him. The men, uh, they were particularly prone, even in cold weather, to walking around with very little clothing on, and in the summertime, they just went in the buff. They were proud of it, and they knew it, and they showed it off. So that was one thing to say about them. Secondly, they were also prone to tattooing. They loved tattooing. And now some of you may be thinking, I like tattoos. Blinn College had, has a, or had, he's, uh, he's, he's my age actually, he used to play in the NBA. His name is Chris Anderson. He's uh, from a little town called Iola right down the road from here. Anyways, he made a very a good living in the NBA, played for like 15 years, uh, and uh, they call him the Birdman. If you've never seen him before, look him up on your phone or on computer, you get an idea how tattooed he is. The Karanka would have been very proud of that. Now, the thing is, is that the Karanka, well, they will tattoo every part of their glorious naked body over time. And so they start normally on the arms, and you'll sometimes see them, uh, excuse me, they'll uh, work around the breast and particularly the nipple. Uh, but you'll see them, and the way they tattoo is, is they take a knife. And I don't mean like a case pocket knife, obviously. I'm talking about some sort of homemade bone knife. And they start digging into the arm. And they cut patterns into the arm and just kind of work again. And then they take uh, some manure. And they take uh, mud and sludge and whatever they get their hands on. And they start packing it into this open wound. Now, uh, pray tell, why would they do that? Well, the answer is they're trying to cause infection. Because what happens when it infections? It, well, it scabs over. So these guys will be tattooed everywhere. Put this next part in your notes, too. Not only were they tattooed in a way that the Spanish had never seen before. Secondly, they were, or next, they were also big into piercings. Uh, if you've ever met a guy who had a gauge in his ear that was this big, uh, you know, something very large, it's not as common as it was, say, four, five, ten years ago, but you still come across those who gauge their ears. Uh, the the Karanka would, would do that. Not only would they gauge their ears, they would also put uh, stuff through their nose and they would ram reeds through there, uh, uh, sticks and straw and stuff. And so you, they cut quite the figure and even into their nipples and such as well. Uh, next up, let's see, what else can I say about them? Uh, they were that, da, 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 they were tattooed. Uh, yes, also they stunk. They smelled. Uh, it, and, and you would think, why on earth would I bring up the fact that they smell? You know, everybody has natural odors. No, these guys stunk, I mean, like a skunk's rear end sort of bad. So what was it that made them stink? So put this now in your notes. Their, their range basically was from, say, Galveston Island, maybe a little bit up the coast toward Beaumont from Galveston Island, all the way down to south of Corpus Christi, somewhere around Baffin Bay or something of that nature, maybe a little, little bit above there. But you find them basically in about a 225-mile length from above the coast down to just south of today's Corpus Christi. And then they would range into, uh, into Texas by about 25 or 30 miles away from the coast. That was kind of the way they ran. So basically, these are the coastal Indians of Texas. So the Karankawa, uh, what they would deal with, and some of you have dealt with when you went fishing down at Rockport or at Freeport or Palacios or something like that, or you lived down that part of the world, is, is that, you know, when it rains down there, they got all that lo low brackish water and they got all that water standing around and it breeds mosquitoes like it's going out of style. And those mosquitoes just love to suck your ever-living blood out of you. And so what these Karanka would do is, is that they would get a hold of alligator, and they would kill these alligators. By the way, they're great huntsmen. I'll get to that in a second. But they would kill these alligators, and then they would take them, and they'd skin them. They would skin these alligators. Have it, I don't know if, as I'm recording this, I don't know if any of you have ever tried to skin out an alligator or have done it successfully. But it is not easy. But they would do it. I mean, these are big men, and they're strong as oxes. And they would skin the alligator out, and underneath the scales uh, or the uh, outer layer of the alligator is this grease. 
they would put, start scraping this grease out of this old alligator, mix it with 11 herbs and spices, and then smear it all over their gloriously naked body. Why? Because it acted as deep woods off. It was their insect repellent. And they weren't the only tribe in Texas that did this. The Atacapans up, and up around Beaumont and the Golden Triangle, they did that as well. But this was their way of warding off mosquitoes. And Cabeza does not, Baca said they stunk, and everybody else who knew them said they stunk. Uh, their diet, by the way, was uh, if they were at the coast, they ate lots of shrimp. They ate lots of oysters. They ate a lot of fish. Uh, if they were in the interior, say, during the wintertime, uh, which was uh, kind of their uh, migratory pra uh, practices and habits, please put this in your notes, they also would, uh, these Karankawa, these uh, Karankawa would basically uh, uh, go bear hunting. They, they were great huntsmen. Um, and some of you may be bow uh, hunters. And some of you may be able to hit a deer at 50 yards or something like that. Uh, this man's name, Noah Smithwick. Noah Smithwick. Uh, he's, he was an old, he, when he was a young man, he was a Texas Ranger, and he's kind of a, uh, the sort of uh, individual, Smithwick. Noah Smithwick was just kind of, he was on the frontier, he's kind of like a young, basically he's a young man who goes and does things and kind of likes to be single, but eventually settles down, and when he was a 90-year-old blind and half-deaf man, he may have been 85, he get, sat down and he dictated his memoirs to his daughters. And they typed it up, and they sent it off to publication. It's a great book called uh, My Recollections of Old Texas Days, and that's Noah Smithwick's book. Anyways, he talked about meeting this Karankawa Indian late in the era of the uh, late before they were ext uh, extinct, and he said this Karankawa, who stood himself about six foot eight, nailed a black bear out of a tree at about 120 yards with a bow. I mean, that's some fancy shooting tech sort of thing. Heck, some people can't even hit with a rifle. A scoped rifle can't hit a, be a black bear out of a tree at 120 yards. But this Karanka with a bow did exactly that. Great huntsman. Uh, oh, and oh, by the way, before I forget this, the women. I think it's worth noting, too, the women were about six foot uh, tall on average, and they, too, uh, oftentimes topless, but they did wear often uh, more clothing than not. Uh, they did not, they raised their boys to be uh, kind of uh, warriors, and they did not wean their boys until, uh, wean their children, but especially their boys, they didn't wean their boys off of the breast until about 12 years old. So, uh, anyways, they, they did it their way. And oh, one last thing to say about the Karankawa Indians is, is that they have a reputation, which the Spaniards already knew about, believe it or not, because of Alonso de Pineda. Uh, they already have a reputation for being cannibals. They have a reputation for being cannibals. So that is a heck of a setup right there. And so you would think... Um, that uh, the Spaniards got to be a little bit worried about what's going to happen to them, but they're so weak as they're laying there on the coast of Texas in no early November of 1528, more dead than alive. They got to figure we're in trouble one way or the other. We're either going to die from exposure or die because we're going to be the dinner for the these cannibals tonight. Uh, but in fact, actually, this is what I'd like you to remember, because a lot of times, at least when I've heard it taught over the years and when it was taught to me, is, is the cannibalism was brought up, and I sometimes will play it up too. Uh, but the cannibalism for the Karanka, well, please make note of this, was not for dietary purposes. They weren't eating for the fun of it. They weren't eating for nourishment. They did it, they, the Karanka was did it because they were trying to take your power. They did it for power purposes. So it would be like if Thomas over there, uh, we use uh, the stu uh, one student here, Thomas, uh, he has his rifle, and I'm a Karankawa, and I see this guy pull the trigger, uh, trigger, Thomas, and my friend falls over dead, that b big old boomstick. Thomas has got some power that I want. How, and, and, and Karankawa thinking is, how do I get a hold of this power? Well, i got to eat him. And so I'm going to eat Thomas if I can get my hands on him. The Alonso de Pineda and the Spaniards who landed along South Texas coast down around South Padre, they remarked about that basic occurrence. So anyways, and that was in 1519. But here in 1528, uh, the Karankawa, they don't eat anybody, at least not yet. Uh, and what the Karankawa do first and foremost in the most uh, kind of uh, emotional act of charity you could imagine, they sit down and they look at the Spanish and they sit down on the coast and they cry for them for half an hour. 
The Karanka were, were very emotional. Please make note of that. They were very emotional. And they sat down and they just bawled their eyes out for 30 minutes with the Spanish because the Spanish were near death on the coast. Then the, then the Karanka would start to build bonfires there into the interior of uh, Galveston Island and maybe the interior of mainland Texas. And they start to build bonfires and these men start picking up these half-dead uh, or mostly dead Spaniards and they drop them off of these bonfires to warm them up, to dry them off, to save their lives. Alvar Nunez, Cabeza de Vaca, who is going to be, like I said, our guide through this uh, trip through Texas, he would have been dead had it not been for the cannibal Karankawa Indians. Now, they're going to eventually put him into slavery and then release him, and he'll run away. But at the same time, it was the reason that any Spaniards or anybody off of this ill-fated expedition to survive has to do with the Karankawa natives. So anyways, um, and when it's all said and done, and I'm going to pick it up and run with it in the next class uh, as well, but all said and done, the Karankawa uh, basically, or excuse me, the Spanish are going to start out with about uh, two, 300 men when they land at Tampa. They get to Texas, they're down to about 200 men. Then many drown. And by the time the remnants of this expedition get back to Mexico proper, there's going to be only four of them left. And that's the thing, is, is that it's a, it's a heck of a failure. It's a heck of a catastrophe, a fiasco. But anyways, it's a heck of a story as well because you're going to find a hand, these Spaniards kind of wandering through Mexico, Texas, and beyond before they finally get back to uh, Mexico into Mexico City by 1536. So anyways, we'll pick that up, and that'll be the second part of this uh, lecture about the exploration of Texas. Uh, so anyways, that's a good place to stop.